Prosecco. Uh, it's a very sultry evening, isn't it? I feel like Blanche Dubois tonight. You know, I'm going to melt and throw myself on the kindness of strangers in a Tennessee Williams play. The, um, also, I'd, I'd like to say some words about the magazine's involvement in this evening. We, we, um, we've published Edward Lucy Smith's poems uh, because we believe he's a promising young poet. The, uh, the book is published. Making the Exit is published as an e-book, and, uh, and uh, as such, doesn't exist in a tangible form. Um, but what I would say to you, it's it's live, it's live today, and amazing is that word live. The, the book is live; it is alive. And and what I what I could say, although you can't see it, it's all around you, as I understand this technology. So in fact, you are immersed in Edward's poetry as you stand there, and perhaps it's, uh, or perhaps it's prickling on your skin, the poems, the poems will be dancing, or perhaps it's the bubbles, but nevertheless, you will be, uh, not only, you are living the poetry as well as hearing it, any second. Uh, Edward Lucy Smith's poetry is a Janus-like collection. Um, it has nobility in the way that it looks forward and back, uh, front and behind. Uh, the past and the future. But um, I'd also, while, while we're reading, I'd also like you to, um, to, to look at these uh, wonderful ladies walking around in um, splendid costumes, including Heather, who's the production assistant to the magazine, but there are many others walking around uh, in various uh, wonderful costumes. These are all reflected or, 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 or made in chiming sense with, Ed, uh, with Joe Machine's paintings, which adorn the walls. Um, I understand there was a pair of leather hot pants for me, but they haven't materialised yet. There's always, there's always a chance. Um, what we're going to do is to ask um, poetry made tangible. We're going to ask for some readings, um, starting with Joe. Um, he's disappeared. Joe, are you coming to read? We're going to have some readings of poems, a um, couple of poems each, um, perhaps one from me, in this order. Um, Joe. Me, Grey Gowry, and then Edward. So, Joe, you can begin. I'm going to use this mic. Mike, switch it on. Hello? Is it work? Mike working? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, off we go. It's really good to see everyone uh, from the London Magazine. It's actually 
pleasure to see you all here again. Uh, can't believe for me it's been almost a year since I've seen some of your faces, so it's really great. I'm going to read a couple of poems now, mainly drawn from my life. Uh, one my have heard before, and the other one probably not. This one is called The Heart of Each and Every Ashtray. <laughs> you in your pink nylon dress, me in my cheap corduroy suit, nicotine gone and holding on to myself. As you count the minutes, I count the dog ends and remember every last cigarette, each bitter fist of smoke. I watch your stricken beauty as you inhale my deadness of soul, sucking your girlhood from a milkshake straw. I knew each act on your shadow stage, each kiss a lie, a placebo of the heart, trampled beneath the jackboot of your blonde haired Germanic youth. The poems in remembrance of your pink nylon dress, ash smudged at the hip, I held you with scorched fingers and laughed with the heart of every ashtray. This one is a poem about my unspeakable childhood. 1979. Bottles smash, windows break into mosaics of glass, whiskey men roll from pub doorways, drunks fighting drunks, throwing punches and miss. And I watch from the corner selling bubble gums, age six, my little tray rattling in my hands. By the saloon door, a sign reads, Deptford Carpet Fitters Beano. In the night street, standing knives measure cheeks and jawlines. Men of linoleum cutting each other, lacerated ears, marking new boundaries between chins and foreheads. Police line the promenade. The uniform sharp black silhouettes against the neon lights of amusement arcades. It's half past eleven, chuck out time. When my father finished work, we went home. I remember the sound of glass crunching under the old man's shoes. As he carried me to the car, there were men slumped on the pavement. Don't look, my father said. But I saw their faces, bright red with blood, from the clotted edges of ragged bottle scars. There was a torn sheet hanging in the railings and a shoe lying in the gutter. We got into the car, the engine started and we drove off. My father, as always, said nothing. I stopped selling bubblegum in 1979. This poem is called Last Swilly, and uh, it's where one of the last princes of Ireland left, left to leg it for Spain um, a few centuries ago. And I, I stood there uh, a couple of years ago, and I was thinking about um, him as he went away to live his life of luxury in Spain. Last Swilly. I squinted as the light squandered itself on three plummets like votive spears cast into scowling water. After this, nothing bright, just a vault of lull, torn mists on the mountains, and three widow crows quarrelling over a rack of fish bones. we found the rocks, a treachery of jag and green tresses beckoning me out under trapped echoes. The gravel tramped back in my footprints, like a retreating army. The crows cursed, and on the far shore, a calvary of wind turbines stirred the door. I wondered what it must be like under those gibbet gyres. The rain smudging the fields, a creak of oil-famished steel. I have heard that all times are present. My ancestors are thriving as I speak, and dying. Their now generates against my now, perhaps divided by no more than the swoop of blades or tides we may not cross. Whatever. I know that it should have been exactly this way. When the O'Neill sailed out from Rathmullen, the dawn as dour as a block of whetstone, black birds and carrion, crooked crosses like milling stars, shorn wind, moaning down to the waves.
Now, listening to Joe, I, a tag came into my mind. I can't identify the writer. <coughs> but it was only those with Dickensian childhoods could look forward to happy and creative middle age. And uh, certainly, he seems a happy and creative fellow now. Listening to Stephen, I've got uh, that fine poem about Swilling. Uh, as a teenager, I lived at Rathmullen on Loch Swilling in a prefabricated um, Martello Tower, famous, of course, in Dublin, in Ulysses, uh, probably pre made and pre cut in Glasgow, and um, shipped over and erected on the Swilling in order to stop. Napoleon coming in by the back door. And most of the troubles between Ireland and Britain has been Britain was suspicious that Ireland was the back door. I'm going to read a poem which I've distributed because sometimes it's nice to have a text about a great Englishman who grew up like me in Ireland and who was a friend of mine for the last 10 years of his life. Uh, I think if I'd known him in his prime, I'd have been too frightened. But he was very agreeable to me in the last ten years of his life because he got it into his head, not only accurately, that I'd saved him from being evicted from his uh, studio. And because in the 70s, before I think this had been said before, but perhaps it had, it's a fairly trite statement, I'd written something saying he was our greatest painter since um, Turner. And this was uh, Francis Bacon. And Bacon grew up in County Kildare, where I had a house for about five, six years of my life, in the same village, because his father was an Irish, uh, was an English uh, trainer. And Kilcullen on the Curra in Kildare is a great um, centre of <coughs> racing in Ireland. <coughs> Now, there are a lot of Christian names in this poem uh, because it's a dialogue of remembered conversations between Francis and myself. And I'm not going to do an annoying imitation of Francis' rather high, piping, precise voice, but I'm going to do it sufficiently for you to know that it's not me talking, it's somebody else. And don't worry about the names, you recognize some, and some are just, these are just two guys talking. It's in a sequence of poems published last year called The Kensington Vespers about London, and Francis lived in um, Reese News in Kensington, uh, very small, where very big paintings came. And it's called Reese News Conversation Piece. Don't worry, I'll send the bill to Miss Beeston. She quite likes you, which is unusual as she only likes me, and I suppose a few women. It may be because I told her you helped me not get thrown out of my studio. Did you know Muriel? I never went much. I am not unstuffy. I don't mind miss, but draw the line at county. She let me off it when we met at Wheelers with my wife. She knew we were waiting for Israel and told me he wouldn't be late for that one. I knew he was dead. Rang the police. They couldn't go in, they said, but try the fire. So I did. We went up a ladder and there he was on the bed, his jaw dropped, mouth rigid and open, clothed. The bedroom was tidy. The rest of the flat, a large one, a waste paper basket version of your studio. Scraps of writing on chairs, pages torn out of books. He wanted to prove Shakespeare was written by your namesake. My ancestor, or so my father said. I liked the way he looked. I've not been frightened since, but I think I've never been frightened of the outcome only of the process. I'm the other way round. The process is interesting. I used to spend a fair amount of time on crucifixions, 
pain and thirst confirm we are alive. And of course, the disposition of the limbs and the torso absorbs one. I sleep little. Dreams are dull and childish. It's pointless to miss the light of reality. So why sleep more than you have to? We are indefinitely dead. I get all the exercise I need in this small room when I'm painting. I never sit down. I dance about like a boxer, fainting with the image, trying to spot when it will come, what it is going to look like. It's usually tosh. Just occasionally, solid appearance builds from the shadow and all the shadow boxing. I feel a stab of happiness. Then I go downstairs and visit my friends and eat and get drunk. Look, you've tried to paint what Eliot called contaminating presences about the human. These work better as shadows for me than dragon shapes or bats. My family being absurdly associated with vampirism. If in the late 18th century you wanted to write a vampire story, you called the vampire Lord Rhythm, like Byron's pal William Mason. It's Hollywood compared to the great curse in humanities. That art collector I introduced you to, George, whispered it in Greek. My hair stood up. Not only the promised end, but an image of horror gone political. Tell me about Ireland, as we have Dublin and County Kildare in common. Just the idea of going there gives me asthma. Ireland was only England when I was young, plus the Hollywood Ed Packet and an interminable train. I told David I liked my mother and grandmother and hated my father, but found him attractive sexually. Of course, he whipped me, or had stable boys do it. That settled things, in a way. I don't enjoy betting on horses because they stop me breathing. Lucian loves them. At his boarding school, he'd sneak out at night to sleep beside one. I'd be dead by morning. He cuts me dead these days. I wrote an essay which struck me as appropriately ass-licking, only I said, you were an imagination, Lucian and I. Boringly self-evident, I'd have thought. There it is. You never painted Caroline. Not enough definition. Wonderful eyes, but aquamarine is a sort of memlin colour. And anyway, Lucian did her. He cuts me too. I miss him. I'm 13 years older. He finds me repetitive, boring. I suppose I am. Of course, I drink more than he does. More to it than that. He's a good painter, but embarrassing whenever he tries to shock, rats nuzzling your balls, and all that. You do not need immense perception to see why he is trying. He should stick to his line of beauty. That girl from behind in a blue dressing gown, lying on her side, I'd give an eye for. And the wild flowers in a Belfast sink. Oh well, I think I am a bit boring. It's the worst thing about age. The best thing is you can still paint. Matisse, whom I've never much gone for, says painting's an old man's game. Picasso did all those dreadful Delacroix, but Jacqueline Pissing is a masterpiece. I've asked John to meet us at Wilton's. He likes you too. Do not flatter yourself. He's a snob. Extraordinary that you're paying. I warn you, I am an expensive guest. I draw the line at Lafitte or Mouton also. They've got a light and lovely cheval blanc. I suppose it won't give you asthma.
Uh, no, I don't. Well, listen, I, after we learned, um, because I had a cunning plot, and the cunning plot is that I want to thank uh, two or three people, um, and this seems the right moment at which to do it. Uh, the first of these is Dr. Wilhelm al Yeah. Uh, because he rescued the London magazine and made it into what now is, and it is in fact the oldest literature of England, founded in 1732. Um, the other person is, uh, of course I wouldn't be here, wouldn't be having my poem published without the London magazine, and therefore without the thank you for that. And the other person is my friend Sergei Rubiaki, who is responsible for making this exhibition of Jerusalem's pictures. Uh, one of the things I think you have to remember is that English culture, British culture, has always been supported by the efforts of outsiders. And uh, Sergei is indeed one of those. He's lived in England for more than 20 years. He has a dual passport, but he remains undoubtedly and indissolubly Russian. <laughs> and I think where art is concerned, particularly the visual arts, there is a trace in him of the great Diaghilev. And the great Diaghilev, uh, the story is one I repeat too often, uh, was being pestered by Cocteau, the very young Cocteau, as to what he had to do to be part of the great avant-garde group uh, created by the Belarus at the time of their first <coughs> And the Russian bear eventually got tired of being the battle of the sun. What do I have to do, sir? What do I have to do? And he turned round on Cocteau and he said, Jean et tombe, astonish. Well, I think perhaps that's what Sergei is looking for when he uh, cultivates the arts. And it's a very Russian reaction. Uh, well, having said that, I would like to read uh, a couple of poems from the collection which the London Magazine is so generously going to publish. On the piano, if you're curious, you will find a set of illustrations, woodcut illustrations, of that portfolio sitting there, um, which accompany the poems. And they are the work of Joe Machine, whose poetry you've just heard, uh, who is also the author of these astonishing pictures, uh, which very often take a well-deserved Mickey out of the English so-called avant-garde art movement. Well, the first poem is really a sequence, I'm cheating. Um, and it was written uh, because of my friendship with an extremely well-known, now and last recently deceased, uh, Bosnia, that is Bosnian Muslim artist with whom I visited uh, the great the site and the graveyard which commemorate the Srebrenica massacre, the worst incident in the Balkan Wars. Um, one, inconvenient people. These are inconvenient people who block the road to a higher purpose. They stop us from being what we could be. Their forefathers betrayed us by choosing to worship God in a different fashion. Now let them pay. They must no longer insult us by existing in the same place as ourselves, under the same sun, on the same planet. This is evident and reasonable. Surely you agree. Two, the great Bad things happen in ordinary places. On one side of the road, rank upon rank of marble markers. On the other, empty buildings that stink of fear. When it took place, the 
winking satellites high in the heavens watched with their cameras. No one had programmed them to say the mass. Three, the beast. The beast keepers were Dutch and much outnumbered. What could I do? There were not that many of us. Hundreds, where they have thousands. And thousands more of those others at our gates in fear. It was not our world. We should not have been present. Their general was a fine looking man. I was spoken once, drinking a toast. Oh. Pursuit. High summer, the woods still green, berries already ripening on some of the bushes. Famished, they crammed in their mouths, with ears alert for those who pursued. Gunfire in mountains, a cry halted as the throat is cut. Five, the youngest. The youngest was 14, maybe growing a moustache, proud to be a man among the men. So they took him with the rest. We don't know if they shot him or cut his throat. Only that his balls had just dropped. <coughs> they killed him for that. Six, bodies of two. Buried, reburied, unburied, stacked up. 2,000 of the nameless, waiting for their stolen names to be returned to them. Only then can they speak, knowing that syllables, once theirs, have now become part of a litany of accusation. Seven, the old man. This is somebody concealed in the array. For years an old man with a big beard, and a ridiculous top knot, played the grizzly and sang of love and loss in neighborhood taverns. He could cure many ills with his magic potions. But friends who drank with him didn't like to mention the blood he still wet but covered his hands. Last one, memories. First they take your life. Then they want to take the memory of it once existed. You were an actor in an event. No one wants to record it. Go away, please. Take those buzzing flies, the odor of grave clothes, and to sanitize the building. What we have kindly prepared for you is called forgiveness, is called reconciliation. Swallow the drugs, vanish. Allow us now to forgive ourselves. The other time is about Istanbul. It's called a diaspora, and it's about Istanbul in winter. Today it's snowing, snowing in Istanbul, Istanbul. Constantinople, New Rome, Byzantium. The city has mislaid its Jews and most of its Greeks. The bones of its Armenians are long scattered. Somewhere far <coughs> to the north, Potemkin's ghost dreams of imperial conquest. There is a noise outside, like someone impatient riding a horse thundering at the bronze of the royal door that should be closed and is open. Upon the dome, a huge weight of fallen and snow. Thank you. We are um, privileged, um, I think too often in a British society, or at least English society, poetry isn't heard 
Um, there's something strange. I, when I lived in Spain, every time uh, a well-known poet went into a cafe, everyone would stand up and applaud them just for being who they were, which was uh, absolutely fantastic, you know? And they wore berries as well. <laughs> but here, you know, it takes something. These, the living word conjured. And uh, when, when Edward said, would we consider, uh, very humbly sent us his collection, would we consider, we were happy um, to consider it. And, and, to, and to edit as well didn't take much, um, because there was poetry of such poise and clarity, uh, such kind of balletic jumping, uh, jumping lines and imagery. But also, thank you very much for Gray and Joe. Um, just shows you, you know, poetry, each, poet, each poet's voice is so different and worth cherishing. And um, I know you're all kind of very hot, but um, I'd like to thank you all just one last time. I'd like to thank Edward most of all, and um, hopefully you can all mingle now. And, uh, and uh, there's, one, there's one thing I would tell you. I said at the very first London Magazine event a few years ago now, was that um, <clears throat> uh, writers are great liars. So I think you should hunt out the writers uh, here, and they will tell you lots of lovely lies. <laughs> so, um, me.